Hello everyone, welcome to the pool table and welcome to episode 4 of the Erskine Arts Podcast. If you have missed any of the other episodes, 1, 2 or 3, please check them out in whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If you're on YouTube, please remember to leave a like, comment and subscribe. Hit the bell icon to be notified when we upload. If you want, if you're on Spotify or anything else, please follow Erskine Arts and you'll get kept up to date with all the podcasts. So we have another guest down tonight, but before we get to our guests, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jason. I'm Lewis. I'm Catherine. I'm Christy. And as I said, we have a, a guest tonight. We have... Marco Cafola done tonight. If you want to give us thanks very much for being here, first of all. Thanks if for you, having me. If you want to give us a, a wee introduction to who you are and sure. what you do. My name is Marco Cafola. I'm a musician, writer, composer and producer. Um, and I've just released a new album last week, Cowboys and Africans, under a, a solo project. Um, and I have another band called Federation of the Disco Pimp. Absolutely, and we've been listening to it today and we're all we're really impressed with it. Thank you. So here today to kind of talk about the album, talk about your experience in the music industry, okay. uh, trials and tribulations <laughs> of it, and some just kind of chat as we usually do. So do some of you guys have anything you don't want to sort of kind of lead from the conversation we were all having earlier on that you'd like to ask? Do you think that making the album by yourself was harder or do you think it was more like benefits of doing it by yourself than it would be doing it with a label? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think both uh, is the answer. Uh, it's uh, by doing it myself gave me the freedom to write any kind of music I wanted to make, um, write any lyrics. I didn't have to answer to anyone, um, which isn't always a good thing. But in terms of creativity, that means I can do what I want um, and write what I want. So that that was that was a lot of fun, and I could invite a lot of friends who are also obviously good musicians to come along and, and play on it. So there was no time restrictions. I didn't have to write a certain amount of tracks at a certain length that the industry kind of pushes you to do. Um, so it was nice to be able to do what I wanted to do. And the negative from not having a label is that once you've finished it, what do you do with it? It's like, then you have to become the record label to push it out yourself. So that's that's the challenge, but and that's a bit that to have a, a label or some kind of management behind you would be amazing. So how, how did you find that, that side of it, the kind of marketing then? What, what kind of things have you kind of picked up that you think do's and do nots and how did you manage to kind of market this to to audience yeah, it's, it's, it's like I don't know it's like magic that everyone seems to be doing it properly apart from you and you just want to know <laughs> how to do it so it's a lot of trial and error over the years I've released the uh, mother albums myself as well so it's known what worked the last time not pestering people too much but at the same time you're, you're selling yourself you know you have to promote yourself and believe in what you did I think a lot of musicians or anyone who releases anything themselves they they get to the point where they finish whatever they're doing and then they're just like oh right that's it you know like but that's just the start of it you know like you have to then say no I'm so proud of this you know I've it's took me every a bit of blood, sweat and tear in my body to, to make this so I want people to hear it you know like rather than play it down and go I've just made a wee album you know it's like I've, I've, this has been two years in the making this album and I want everyone to hear it so things at work are just like tagging people who are in it like on your social media just saying and, 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 and telling them how good they are as well saying oh, I've got this great bass player Ross and he he's the best and you should listen to his sound and, and he's playing his passion in us you know and tagging them all uh, things like that um, it's just um, yeah it's just try to reach out to as many people as possible try and find out who kind of likes the style of music you like and then say well if you like these kind of guys then you might like this as well um, I've, I've started I put posters up for the first time myself as well in, in Glasgow uh, which I got a great response from um, and, and ironically it worked better on social media because you post a picture of a poster in the real world you know yep. and then it goes not viral, but it's shared a lot more because they go, wow, you're on a, a poster. You must be doing something right. <laughs> in the real world. I, I know, yeah, totally, because it's, everything's obviously online now, you know. So um, do, I've never did things I've never done before like that. I've I found uh, worked. So the next time if I do another album, then I'll definitely put posters up. I'll definitely tag people on it. Um, I'll tag wherever I've been in. I've, another good thing, uh, sorry, was telling people about yourself because... 
I'm this artist, Kafala. I'm not, I'm just a guy, you know, like, kind of, so people want to know your story. Like, even if I, I can use the X Factor as an example, X Factor really isn't about the music, is it? It's about the story of, oh, you know, I come from here and I've worked my, my way up and now look at me now. So it, it, everyone wants to know your story. So tell them about who you are, what you like, what you don't like, uh, what your passions are, who your friends are, who your family are, what inspired you. I think if you just be yourself, really, that that can that can work more. I, I found that for me, but just by being myself and not try to pretend I'm someone I'm not, and I'm not this big name in the industry. I'm just a hardworking musician who believes in what I do, and and that's all I'm trying to get across. Um, and I, I found that's been the most responsive from people so far. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, people like honesty. You know what I mean? And I think people get that right away off the bat. You know, if someone's honest with them, you you know when someone's not being honest with you. You kind of mentioned that a lot of the push was on social media. So how do you think the advent of social media and technology has either helped or hindered the music industry? How do you think it's made things easier? Or uh, Obviously, music's more accessible to people than it ever kind of has been. Absolutely, um, yeah. I, again, there's, there's so many positives and so many negatives. The, the positives are, are for sure that every piece of music is now available to everybody, you know, and you can listen to all this amazing music. But the problem is every piece of music is available to everybody. So yep. where do you start? You know, like now when you can pick everything, you know, having unlimited choice isn't necessarily a good thing. So um, it, it's great that it's there, but you still need somebody to lead you or to inspire you or to recommend something for you. So, but the great thing because of technology is that uh, when I started uh, recording properly about 10 years ago, uh, I got somebody in New York to mix it. But I never met them face to face, never spoke to them on the phone. It was all through emails. I recorded it here in Scotland and then we just emailed the files over. He mixed them and sent them back. So that's the, the advantages of technology and the internet yeah. uh, for me. And uh, that, that that was mind blowing to, because somebody you've never met who lives in another, a different continent gets what you're trying to do. You know, yeah. uh, that, that's quite amazing, you know, but yeah. uh, the more this happens, the less it is. People think that's amazing, but just take it for granted. I know you can travel yeah. the world without leaving your house. Exactly, yeah. you know, and that, that's a great thing. You can you can learn so much like through so YouTube and internet and stuff like that, and, and you should. But you need to get out there as well. And and how do you write about anything if you've just sat in your house your whole life as well? You know, so you need experiences. You know, as far as I'm, as I'd say anyway. Yeah. Do you kind of think that without social media, it would be like harder or easier to get your music across to people? I think I think it'd be harder in my position because I don't have a label behind me. So at least now I'm on Spotify, I'm on iTunes, I'm on all those so, uh, social media platforms. So e even like 10 years ago when I finished something and I, w I wanted somebody to hear it, I'd have to physically post a CD mm -hmm. to someone. But now I can just put a link to... They don't even have to download it anymore. They can just go to Spotify and, and stream it, you know? So And, and what you find is because... We, Everyone wants it easy, so nobody wants to download and wait even two minutes for something to download. Everyone that's so instant access, everybody wants now. So, the, by having Spotify, you can send that link to somebody and just see if you just press this button, you'll hear what I'm trying to get you to hear. So, I think it's easier if you don't have a kind of support unit or like a, a management or a record label behind you, uh, it's much easier to do it through uh, the internet for sure. You just basically live on social media anyway, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yep. Catherine, can you move right in when you're going to ask a question? I know you're right at the corner, but try and get as close to the mic as you can, okay? Okay. Um, oh, sorry, no, you go. Say, how do you guys find new music? Like, how do you come across it? Like, when everything's there? It's usually like when you're listening to... It's usually when you're listening to a band and then you scroll down and it's like recommended artists. And scroll that, down on what? Like, um, the... Page the band page. All oh, right. Yeah, okay. Like, so like websites or Facebook pages. Yeah, like um Spotify and that. Spotify. Yeah. How about yours? Um. Well, we get it through friends, but that's because they've found it on social media or something, or like sharing stuff from mainly Lewis and the music club that we have. So. Okay. Well, that's at least more organic than even if somebody something is recommended by an algorithm and then you've listened to three albums, say, but one you really like, then you're personally saying to your friends, this is the album you should listen to. So then that becomes your personal recommendation rather than just an algorithm, you know? So so that, that's great, you know, like to do it that way. And then again, you're actually got something to say by saying, I like this music because of the sound, like you were saying earlier on as well. Which is what something we really try to push with, you know, uh, Lewis, you mentioned the music club something we're trying to create to kind of get 
I mean, very thankful, very grateful you brought down some physical media for yeah. us. Um, so we're trying to, you know, get back into that. We've I spoke to someone last week who shall remain nameless. It didn't <laughs> didn't really know how a CD worked, or okay. <laughs> I, I actually didn't know how to open the CD case. Right. Okay. The word of a lie. <laughs> Where'd I plug in the headphones? So we're trying to get you know more tangible, you know, physical media and sure. appreciating a bit more. And obviously, knowing that you know the access to streaming and that is you know is amazing, but. Mm-hmm being able to appreciate you know personal recommendations which obviously you have had from me and Craig yeah. but not Ali oh come on <laughs> <laughs> but that's something else but once when people used to give you CDs or tapes people would make you tapes you know like you know, yeah, when I was a lad yeah exactly you know like you know, it was great that, because somebody took the time even if somebody makes you a Spotify playlist it's, it's a tailored list of songs that they think that you'll like mm-hmm. but oh, Obviously, getting a, a vinyl record holding it's so tangible, it's so big, you know. You're like, it's well, an experience, it's, yeah. it's definitely experience. And, and I mean, I'm still very much into the artwork as well. Absolutely. I spend as much time on that as, as the music, arguably, as well. So, because that's your first well, when you used to go in and buy physical like copies of the music, the first thing you see is the artwork. So, that sometimes would sell it, you know. If you don't like the colors or the image on yep. the front of it, then then maybe you go, oh, I don't fancy that, even though it's probably. It could be the best music you've never heard, you know. So I really love the the back artwork and the the back of the album. Oh, okay. I think it's great. <laughs> if you do want to check out the album, obviously the artwork, the the link is down in the description as we where, where you can get it. Highly recommend that you do so and go and listen to it. We've been enjoying it. Christy, you got anything? Um, what were you asking earlier on? Um, I was asking about gigs and like what's the biggest gig you've ever performed the i suppose uh the biggest out to an audience was uh, my, my other band federation we were the house band on bbc one for the commonwealth games so they did the tonight at the game show uh and it was mark chapman and uh, claire Bolden. they were the presenters so it was yes. a highlight show uh, mm-hmm. for the commonwealth games in 2014 uh, so that went out to like seven, eight million people. It was BBC One National, so we were like the house band. So when a guest came on, we'd play a sting to to bring them on and things like that. That was that was wild. That was great to <laughs> be a studio. I mean, I love the Roots. You know, the the band of Roots, yeah, yeah. the hip hop band, and they're the house band and Jimmy Fallon. So in my head, I'm like, oh, we're the Roots. You know, it's like, <laughs> a, and, and it was great. And it, you had to think on the spot. Like they would change guests, so you'd have to pick different uh, bits of music and then you're trying to communicate with the guys because it's live TV as well so you're like kind of like nods and winks to like let's do that again or, or not do that you know so uh, and I had like headphones on like this but I would have like the producer the director the band all in my ears asking me questions so it was a real pressure but it was a great pressure to have so to play my own music because we used a lot of my music as well in fact one of the songs they use is the, the theme for the, the show as well so that was that was wild you know so that was definitely I'd say the biggest in terms of outreach yeah, uh, it doesn't get know. much bigger than that really <laughs> in terms of outreach does it uh, kind of uh, going on from that Christy I think you were talking about the first first kind of gigs you'd done so do you, what was the first gig you'd done do you, know, do you remember it quite vividly and what was your kind of thoughts and experiences when you were Doing it, you know, performing. Yeah, oh, I, I definitely remember the first kind of public gig I did was in the Arches in Glasgow, um, and it was through my school. I was like 15, and my music teacher, she applied for a songwriting workshop, and Davy Scott from the Pearl Fishers, a Glasgow band, he came down and took the workshop, and we worked on uh, these songs. Um, so we, all, we only wrote one song, well, I only wrote one song, and then there was three other bands from three different schools, uh, and they took us all down to Riverside Studios uh, in the south side of Glasgow. We recorded it, which was amazing. Like I was saying earlier on, we, like back then, we couldn't really record in the house or like we didn't have access to that technology. So we went into a, a recording studio and uh, we got to record my song and I was like all excited and it was a wee love song and it was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, like, you know. Um, and then we went to the Archies and we all played the, the song in the Saturday afternoon and it was great. It was on a on a stage. Uh, we had a dressing room. They had like juice and crisps and like wow, they're treating us so well, you know, like kind of like, and uh, so that that was my first ever public gig and, and I got a real taste for it as well. And like something for me, like like I, I find a lot of musicians aren't like this. I, I love writing music as much playing music. So the thrill of actually hearing my song being played was just as exciting as playing the gig itself. So uh, and that. That was like a wee epiphany at that point to go, 
I want to write music as much as as perform music. So was was that kind of the the moment where it where it did click that you wanted to do this as a career? And kind of what what led up to that beforehand? What mm-hmm. kind of got you into music? Did your parents were they particularly musical or? Well, my, yeah, well they weren't uh, music players, mm-hmm. but they were the biggest music lovers. Yep. Um, my mum loved like disco and and soul music, um, and my dad is a huge eclectic taste in blues and uh, a lot of like like Bob Dylan and, and, and a lot of those kind of uh, old school guys. Um, so I would I would always be around music in the house, even though nobody played anything. Mm-hmm. And and how I actually got started playing, I was telling the guys earlier, was we used to get uh, free half-hour lessons uh, at school. Oh, right, okay. So I would see everybody in my, my maths class like getting pulled out. Like I'm like, where are they going? You know, like kind of... And like history and stuff, and I had to st- sit there, like, and I didn't really enjoy it at the, at the time. So I was like, I'm just going to sign up for whatever they're signing up for. And then they just put you on piano, and I was like 15, so it was quite late to playing uh, compared to a lot of other uh, players. Um, but as soon as I sat and I started getting taught the piano, I was just like, wow, this is this is something, you know, like kind of uh, something different. Um, and then I, I kind of got fast tracked because I didn't have the luxury of learning and go through grades. I never really did. I did one grade, like grade three. Uh, but my piano teacher put me in for a piano competition uh, quite soon after I played, and I won it. Like kind of. So again, this instant gratification of get put on stage, they listen to you, you win this competition. Everyone's like, yeah, it was like that. I, I liked the attention, maybe you know. <laughs> it's like you know, to start with, you know. Yeah, so definitely. That that's, that was definitely the precursor to it, you know. But then. Because then you didn't really associate music, like listening to music, to what you're doing at school, you know, like, you know, that was something you had to learn at, at that point in my head to actually enjoy music and watching my dad and my mum singing along to all this be- beautiful music. And then and then suddenly it kind of crosses over going, wow, I could actually play this song that they're, they're listening to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then that brings you closer to your family and, and your friends, you know, and then people at school, oh, can you play this and can you play that? And, uh, and it was fun and then it, it becomes really sociable as well. How did you, like you say you write your own songs? So Catherine, move right into the mic, go on. Where do you kind of get like your inspirations for your own songs? Um, well, th- for this album, um, it was all, I wrote the lyrics first and I never really wrote lyrics, I wrote a couple of songs uh, prior to this album. So for this album, it was all about the lyrics uh, because I've got a little girl now, she just turned four the other day and I was out with other bands a lot. So I couldn't actually sit at the piano. I used to, that's how I started. I'd sit at the piano and just noodle away and then you'd, you'd get a wee, a wee idea and then you'd just develop it. But um, for this album, I, I'd, I couldn't, I was watch, I would watch my little girl during the days. So if you go to play the piano, she'd be grabbing your hand, like you, now she wants your constant attention and, and it's amazing. Um, or else you're sitting in the back of your van driving somewhere so you couldn't play the piano. So I just started um, kind of taking interest more in what was going around uh, about me and I just started uh, writing down what was going on in the world um, and that's where this album came from anyway. Like that, that inspired that about, it's been a crazy few years with everything that's been going on with politics and, and stuff, has. you know, so it was actually great for me personally. <laughs> like in a, all this madness, I was like, oh great, that's a song right there, you know, so. Um, but but bef- before that, it was just, uh, I get... I love music. Music is just my favourite thing in the world. So, like, I'd always listen to something and I'd be like, wow, this is great. I love that little bit there. And then you, you try and play these things. And then subconsciously, you're, you're, you're working things out all the time, you know. So maybe if a year later, a week later, this little thing comes through your head that you, because you've been listening to something. And I used to do it, especially when I started off. I'd get up at three in the morning, run down the stairs, like a keyboard or something, and just like play it. Mum thought I was going mad, but I was like, kind of, <laughs> um, and then just had to write it down or record it, whatever. And then, um, so just listen, listen to other music is definitely how I started. And then it kind of developed into what was going on around about me that kind of brought lyrics into it. Um, what like, musicians did you listen to like growing up? Growing up, um, I definitely st- like. I mean, being a piano player as well. Like, I was, um, there was not a lot of like kind of like piano heroes like you get guitar heroes, you yeah. know, like kind of. So, uh, by default, like there was like Jerry Lewis, yeah, yeah. Uh, like old school guy again, um, and then there was um, 
uh, uh, Ray Manzarek for The Doors. Um, so anyone who kind of played keys, Stevie Wonder is a huge influence for me. Um, anyone who played keys, I was just kind of like trying to find them, you know. So um, so I'd listened to a lot of uh, their stuff, but I, I loved, I, I'm kind of frustrated guitarist as well. Like, kind of, so I love like Jimi Hendrix, I love. Um, like, every, I, I love guitar music yeah. as well actually so because if you'll notice if you listen to my music I write all the riffs as well so it's, it's very riff guitar heavy um, and that's me just thinking like playing air guitar you know it's like because I love guitar music so uh, all the blues guys as well so um, it's by, by default I got into like, like keyboard players as well so another big influence for me was Miles Davis the jazz trumpet player uh, just because he kept changing his style every few yep. years as well like kind of and he went for a 70s period of just all electric music so I was like, because my mum liked dance music and like like disco music, he started crossing into that. A lot of musicians then did so, uh, all that electric band stuff, uh, and then they were getting Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea, all these keyboard players who were just mind blowing. So, uh, all those kind of like guys to start. You can definitely hear the you know the disco and the funk and soul influences sure. <laughs> throughout the album. Uh -huh. um, Actually, I think Ali was kind of gesturing me there. We're going to pass over Ali and see if I think our audience here, that I'm sure you can see in the background, have got yeah. a few burning questions, yeah. no matter how crazy they are, if they would like to ask them. Have they got a microphone? They do. Thanks, Jessica. Nice. Is there a place that you've been to that's influenced you a lot? Ooh, yeah. Um, I'd say my biggest influence is uh, New York. Um, just... Again, that, as I was saying earlier on, um, I, well, growing up, I was fascinated with New York just because it's in every movie that you've probably yep. ever seen. So if you've ever been to New York, it's most ex one of the most exciting places you can go to because it's so new, but it's so familiar because it's in every movie, as I said. So uh, going over there, like my dad took me over there when I was 18 and it, it blew my mind. So just this 24 hour city, you know, when you come from Glasgow and Glasgow is a, a really cool city as well, but like everything's based on, on New York, you know, like Absolutely. in the Western um, uh, side of things anyway. So uh, everything's bigger and better, like when you're 18 anyway. So that uh, that that inspired me. But then, as I said, I sent a track over uh, for Joel. Uh, Joel Hamilton is a producer who lives in Brooklyn. Uh, and then I went over to meet him and he, he, he blew my mind as well. Uh, he... He would say, "Listen, Marco, I love the tracks. Let's make an album." And I'm like, "Oh, I'm just a, a wee guy from Glasgow. You're <laughs> this big producer in New York, you know." And and he said something to me that like changed everything. He says, "Why not?" And then, like a lot of Americans have that attitude of "Why not?" and "Can do," you know, like kind of almost a, a self uh, like they're entitled to it, you know. And and sometimes it can be an arrogant way, but a lot of time it's just like, "Well, why not?" You know, like kind of. And then I, I was like, "Okay, why not?" So um, I just. I applied for funding, uh, the band, we just uh, grouped together any money we made and then suddenly we had like an album and we recorded it here and then me, uh, Ross and Mikey uh, and the band, we flew over uh, to do the mixing um, uh, with Joel and, and then just being in, in that environment, it's such a creative environment over there, like in Brooklyn especially, it's like a little village and everyone's knows everyone for a start and they've all been in like real like bands out there touring yeah. and dropping at the studio and stuff and and everyone's helping each other out so like away from all the as I said the instant part that you loved was the, the buildings and the, the skyline and uh, it was it was actually a community that inspired me more than anything and I've never been around that anywhere else as tight as I've seen in Brooklyn uh, just everyone wanted to help each other uh, on the last album the Namarat album I've got uh, the trumpet player from The Roots playing on it. Uh, I've got um, a girl Sasha Dobson who's in a band with Nora Jones. Like kind of all these like the musicians who are in big bands mm. and touring bands, and they came in. They weren't expensive. And they were just excited to be playing on something. Wow, you're from Scotland, you know? Like now, kind of <laughs> the, 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 the Scot the Scots thing goes a long way. Everyone loves <laughs> Scotland, you know? Like we don't, but everyone else does, you yep. know? So, um, so 
the fact is that they just wanted to come and play on it and then you're like wow you're like one step away from Questlove or Nora Jones or uh, all these other amazing musicians um, so the fact that they all band together and they drop in just to see what's going on uh, I, I, I think I try and bring that back here when I mean, I'm doing music is try and help other people out as well if, if, if I can and, and, and just say yes to everything I was saying earlier on as well like just say yes because what's the worst that could happen if it's a bad experience then you just don't do it again you and know? you learn from it don't yeah, you absolutely. if it's a bad experience hopefully <laughs> hopefully <laughs> you don't make the same mistake twice <laughs> we've got any other questions uh, what is your favourite note on the piano uh, what's your favourite musical note my favourite note 1 out of 12 well Go on. I'm going to say <laughs> yeah, just uh, right away E, f- e flat um, mm. uh, e flat because of Stevie Wonder, because actually. Of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because he, uh, if you don't know us about Stevie Wonder, well, you'll probably know he's blind, but because he's blind, he wrote most of his music on the black keys because physically you could feel the shapes. So, uh, just being uh, so by con- being conditioned with a lot of Stevie Wonder music as a, as a kid, mm-hmm. then you try and play it, you're like, oh, why is he writing it? Now he's trying to be difficult, but he wasn't. It was just easier because you had two two keys and then three right. keys so he could like feel his way around because he was blind it would be a lot easier for him to write on that so a lot of his music's in E flat um, and and I, I, it's a kind of go to point for me as well a lot like, of classic rock tunes as well you know, a lot of yeah. classic rock bands you know, they tune down the E flat yeah, as well absolutely. so if you ever play with an ACDC Kiss albums or Aerosmith stuff you probably think your guitar's totally out of tune what about you is you got a favourite a favourite musical note go on Catherine I know you're passionate about musical notes What's your favourite note? Name me one note. <laughs> Lewis. Um, a, just to be basic. Just to be basic, A. You know, it's a guitar, it's a guitarist <laughs> note. <laughs> <laughs> it's equal to any other note in it, Christy? Um, e minor. E minor, so call that's your favourite key, your favourite chord? Yeah, favourite chord. Mm-hmm. What about yourself, Ewan? Have you got a favourite note? Where's the mic? My personal favourite note is actually the C major. C major, so like in the key of C major, so you like the C note. Is that because it's right, right in the middle? Oh, he's away already. Mm-hmm. We got any other questions happening? Uh, what other obstacles did you overcome in high school? Ooh. <laughs> right <laughs> into um, the personal. Zone. No, uh, well, I was listening to your podcast. I was saying as well that you, you come from really great questions. So uh, young people don't hold back. It's <laughs> I love it. You should be encouraged. Um, I was very shy uh, for a lot of it as well, um, and then, I mean. Especially when you start writing music, you're actually putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. You know, you're saying, "Wow, this is." E- even when you say, when you recommend that song or that album to somebody, you're putting your own taste on the line. So you're saying something about yourself. So it's all an extension of how shy or confident you are. So um, I was quite quiet and shy. I came from a rough area. Uh, there was a lot of crazy stuff going uh, around about me uh, as well. So the the goal was just not to be killed. You know, <laughs> so it was like, you know, <laughs> uh, or not to be beaten up for been into music or, or whatever you know so I, I was quite quiet at first um, um, so that was a big obstacle but again it goes back to just being yourself you know like now kind of I wasn't rough in the sense that I'm not a fighter you know like now kind of I wasn't really that outspoken about things back then as well so I was just being me you know and, and I think everyone can relate to it, as, as you said earlier on uh, like when people can tell when you're not being yourself. So if you're just being yourself, then it's up to them. There's nothing else you can do but be yourself. And if they don't like you, then, well, you can't please everybody all the time anyway. So uh, shyness and, um, again, in my music department at school, there was nothing there. When, when I went to uni eventually, everyone was like, oh, I did this song in, in chamber orchestra at school. And I'm like, well, I never had an orchestra. We had an old out of tune piano and recorders. That was the <laughs> ex- extent of my music department. But we had amazing music teachers who realised coming from a, a kind of rough area that they didn't have a lot of facilities. So they just encouraged you uh, to go up to music at lunchtime, after school, before school, uh, just because they saw that you were into something. So... Um, there was no real bands. They, they tried to put the, it was makeshift bands. I, I used to write music for like piano uh, and flute and recorder because there was one flute and one recorder and the piano. So um, it was so th- these kind of obstacles like being shy, not having much around you musically as well at school. Um, just by being being myself, I hope got me through a lot of that. You know, absolutely. It's not enough recorder solos and no. songs really. <laughs> you know I mean? Have we got anyone else? Or is that us? From the audience. Go on, Ewan. 
Um, okay, um, Mark, um, see um, after the gig, right, and you're absolutely exhausted and you're tired and you want to go and get something to eat. Um, is there any kind of like junk food or restaurant that you're fancy going and you're thinking, okay, I need to, I'm out of a gig, I just want to get something <laughs> to eat. I'm so hungry. So is there like, anywhere at all you you really enjoy going to? This is or a really, over this in is, America, at least. Yeah, this is a really important question, actually. I you agree. know, <laughs> kind of, um, I love, there's a place in, in Glasgow, uh, non Viet, uh, Vietnamese food. Um, which I love, and I don't have to be after the gig, I'll be before the gig. In fact, it's actually, if you're eating before the gig, you don't eat anything too heavy, because, totally. uh, you know, you want to be, like, weighed down, and I have done it as well, but, like, uh, non Viet, uh, there's one in Suckill Street, which is brilliant uh, food, it's nice and fresh, and it, it's quite healthy, actually. Uh, I love Paisano, I love pizza, you know, like, kind of, so, uh, Paisano pizza is is, is great, Um yeah, o- over in the States as well. It's the same idea, pizza slices, you know, like kind of, it's all good. So uh, I-, I think as well, after a gig, you're, you're, you're high on, on the endorphins mm-hmm. of, of the gig, if it's went well especially. So, I mean, I, I found that, like now, we're getting deep here, like the comfort eating as well, like kind of, like afterwards, just to bring yourself down. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> <comfort> <laughs> totally. Eating, so, uh, <laughs> so, so you think... You, because you're, you're interacting with people and you're getting that energy and then you're suddenly in the house and it, it's normal again and Absolutely. you're not around anything, you're, you're still buzzing. So by eating food, it kind of brings you back down because you're just trying to inhale, you're trying to keep up that that and, and uh, those those feelings. So the uh, stodgy food like pizza really <laughs> brings you down, but I don't recommend it at three in the morning, even though, even though I've done it a lot of that. Yeah, so. <laughs> Can I lead on from that? Can I offer you in question? Do you have any particular post or pre-gig routines is that what you were going to ask yeah, sorry, right. <laughs> sorry took the words out of your mouth uh, that you have like anything that you do beforehand I know mm-hmm. personally before a gig you know I kind of go the opposite to where I usually am I don't really like speaking to people or socialising yeah. very much until after it's done then I'm happy to chat to people do you have anything that you kind of go through or things you do before or mm-hmm. after playing um, I mean I suppose I like a wee minute to myself mm-hmm. like just before the gig but I do like. I'm. I'm not totally again into. I'm. I'm the musician. You're the. You're the audience. You know. Like, can I? I will not speak to you before or after. I, I quite like soaking it up. I like. I like walking on stage before it's set up as well. You know, and just and feeling it. You know, and, and go. It's like self projection. You know, it's like can I. I mean, I got that from Muhammad Ali. You know, it's like now the fight is won before you get into the ring. You know, it's like the gig is done before you've done the gig. You know, like I try to adapt that mentality so that um, I stand on the stage before it's built up and I I just imagine interacting with the crowd and enjoying that. So that's definitely something I I try and get a wee second to do. And then I like speaking to people at the gig before we go on uh, on stage. And just like if you're having a party, you want to welcome people in and and, and just interact with them. But I do like just before we go on to stage, um, just have a wee minute to myself. And I like a kind of tribal grunt with the band as well. Like just kind (laughs) of like, we all just like, just get out, you know, like kind of just, just, you know, like let's do this, you know, because, uh, again, the more prepared you are, I would say the less nervous you are going on stage, for me anyway. Um, but you can still see it, it doesn't apply to everybody. Like my other band, they're a seven-piece band with different personalities. Some people are nervous going on the stage. So you can see that in the guys, you know, so you just want to hold them and like, and just, just say we've got each other's back. We're a community, we're a family, you know, it's like, because music, like if you're in a band especially, and, and I've always encouraged that as well, like I don't want like, we live in a time now where a lot of people just session and playing different bands. I like a core band, if possible, the whole band is is there full time, even though you're not full time gigging that band. It's just so that they feel responsible for this as well. So they become best friends, family members. You share so many experiences with them. So it's really it's really important that they're okay as well. So just a wee kind of hug or a wee grunt before we go on stage is, is, is fun as well, you know. So. Yeah, a hug or a grunt, you've heard yes. it here first. <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else, folks? Um, you were saying they're sessioning. You were saying they're sessioning. Like, how did you kind of get into that? Uh, I, I got into it uh, from just being, uh, by gigging, actually. by um, It's just... When you go out gigging, you never know who's listening to you, who, who's at the gig. Uh, other band members, they're, as I was saying as well, everyone's nobody's really in one band anymore as well because um, like uh, 
maybe at this level in a lot of ways because you have to if you're trying to make money from music as well you have to be able to play different like styles of music so um, you could be playing and there's another band in the bill and they go well, we need a keyboard player we don't have keyboards but we don't want to take them on the road so we'll just bring them in I, I do that for a few bands I record in all their albums but I don't actually necessarily tour with them I might do the launch date with them but then they go into tour they can't afford to take another member so um, so it's just it's socialising as well like hanging out with, with other musicians as, as well it's ironically it's, it's quite important as well to just to, to be you have to be in it to win it kind of, kind of thing um, just be around other musicians and letting people know again this goes back to the shyness thing that like a lot of musicians have uh, by by self uh, pre- um putting yourself forward for things you know because a lot of musicians don't do that as well and, and, and rightly so because they might be a bit shy but you have to say this is great music. I love this. If you ever need a keyboard player on it, I'd be available to do it. So, because the phone isn't going to ring really, you know, it might ring once in your life, but like ultimately you have to go out and find the work yourself. So, but you definitely have to put yourself forward and go to gigs and approach other musicians and say, listen, I just love that. And sometimes there doesn't have to be an agenda. You could just actually give somebody a compliment, you know, like and just say, this is really cool. That You've got two keyboard players already. I just want to tell you that. But then, Maybe one time that keyboard player can't make it and they need it for one gig or one album. Um, and, and then through that. And then even through... I actually do a lot of session stuff in New York, but I do it here uh, because uh, I've, I've done like nearly three al- two and a half albums uh, with, with, with Joel um, in New York. So he knows how I work. He knows the style I play. And then if he needs a keyboard player because of technology, I say, Marco, I'll fire the track over. Can you record it? Sometimes I go in the studio. Sometimes I can do it in my house and fire it back. So I've done a lot of stuff for New York artists who I've never met as well, um, just because they know who you are and they know what kind of music you, you like. Because it's not necessarily about being the best piano player or singer or guitarist it's sometimes they just like your sound or how you play the instrument and that's important as well it's not it's not a competition and it shouldn't be a competition it should be about finding again being yourself and, and that should be an extension through your music as well so sometimes i'm totally wrong for this gig not because i'm not good enough like technically it's just that but I, the kind of music i play or the style of piano i play isn't going to suit this song and that, that's totally okay as well so definitely just kind of all walks of life what we talk about here just being proactive you know doing stuff yep. you know what I mean being confident just mm-hmm. going out and doing it it's hard it's, 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 it's so hard totally. you know everyone you know and what you'll find as well is the more confident people who are out there they're probably the shyest people as well it's almost a Aye. it's a, it's a mechanism just to to deflect attention in a lot mm-hmm. of ways as well Absolutely. so uh, you might think that that guy or that girl is really confident but they're, they're probably actually more shyer than you are, or less confident at least Aye. than you are. So, don't be afraid just to just to put yourself forward and just again just tell people that you like something as well because you never know where it leads to. And say yes. And say yes, Aye. absolutely. So what is the worst that can happen? Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, going to slightly change it up here. I've kind of stole some questions from some famous TV shows and different questionnaires. So, don't know if you get you if you wouldn't have heard of Desert Island Discs, would you have? Any idea at all? So, in Desert Island Discs, you know, you're stranded in a desert island um, and you get to choose, well, they'd use eight albums, a book and one luxury item. You're given the works of Shakespeare and the Bible yes. uh, as a given, but we're, we don't have the time for it, so we're going to do five. Uh, so I'm going to ask you this as well, but if you were stuck in a desert island, Marco, and mm-hmm. you could only bring five albums and a book <sighs> wow. and a, a luxury item, <laughs> uh, what would you bring? Um, my my favorite album is my favorite like mu- piece of music is a Miles Davis uh, set of songs uh, in a silent way. It's in the silent way sessions, so I don't know if that's classed as one album or we'll, just we'll, we'll accept okay. It. So <laughs> simply because it's almost like dreaming. It's just you can really see where it starts and where it ends. It's instrumental music, but it's it's like a painting. You know, it's like this big like canvas and. There's, every time you listen to it, or every time I listen to it, sorry, I get something new from it, and I can run to it, I can chill out to it, you know, like it can be background music, it can be the centre of attention, it's just, and, and there's not much going on as well. That's it's it's, it's actually one of the first uh, forms of uh, sampling and looping in music, because right, okay. uh, they just cut up the drums and just like, uh, and in fact, uh, some phrases and just looped it. So that's why there's no definitive chorus verse like middle eight it's just it just feels like it goes on forever so 
I would say if I can take that absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life album changed changed my life as well that was just so funky and and, and, and cool yet lyrically again getting all, all your all my favorite music is you get something from it every time you listen to it so um with Stevie Wonder it was always the, the excitement and the energy of the music but then He's actually got a lot to say lyrically as well. Um, so I never got into that too, maybe later on as well. So Songs in the Key of Life. Um, the Doors, the, the first Doors album as well. Again, Keyboard Led, Raven Zerich. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think there were only like 20 when they made that album as well. Like five days in the studio, bang. It's just it's still it's so raw. And uh, like Jim Morrison is just like kind of um, his lyrics as well. Um, and his energy, he's... I mean, I'm not into like having a, a rock hero, but like if there's somebody like Jim Morrison is for me is the epitome of, of rock kind and of roll. the essence of cool. Exactly, you know, <laughs> you know like kind of. Uh, I know I'm totally missing something here as well. Um, uh, I, I'm going to actually pick another Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue. Um, Classic. Yeah. Is I, 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 a story about that was I walked into um, HMV on Circle Street and. My dad liked jazz, other people liked jazz. And I said, I like jazz, but I never actually had my own record. So I didn't even really know who Miles Davis was at the time. And I walked up to the, the jazz section and I picked up this album. And it was that album, Kind of Blue. Again, it was a cover, him looking yeah. cool, <laughs> like his trumpet. And so again, that, that sticks in my head when you think of like the first protocol as you see the cover. Um, and then reading the notes inside it, there was, this, this blew me away. It was like the musicians on that album never saw the music before they recorded it. He just put it there and there's a lot of improvisation. And music, it still is, like magic, you know, like for me anyway, you know, like, so I was like, well, how, how can they go and record something if they've never heard it before, mm. they've never practiced and stuff? So uh, that, that's that's uh, definitely there. And was that four? Yeah. Uh, last album. Um, um, this is a hard one. <laughs> We've got one that album left. Spice Girls, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just the singles. Um, uh, I'm going to say um, uh, yes, close to the edge. Um, so uh, big yes fan at the oh, back really? of the room. Yep. Yes, I wrote my it? dissertation at, at uni on yes. Oh as really? Well. <laughs> I actually got to speak to Rick Whitman once about it as well, which is great. Yes. <laughs> so uh, again, another keyboard. Like I found these bands again through. Uh, uh, being a keyboard player and then you're finding other bands that have big keyboard presence in mm -hmm. them so uh, Close to the Edge again quite like in a silent way it's just this beautiful piece of music that right. goes on forever it feels like uh, and again there's something I can always get from it as well something new what yep. about a book a book um, do you know what I'm going to say something quite simple like John Steinbeck any John Steinbeck book um, uh, because he was the first kind of author that actually could see in my head you know like now music was it was easy when i heard music i got all these images and all these colors like music just something cl clicked for sure but with, with, with books i don't even read a lot of books to be perfectly yeah. honest i read a, like, a, a lot of biographies of musicians but when it comes to uh, actual like offers and uh, books I, i'll be honest i don't read a lot um but Do uh, john steinbeck was always something that never felt like a chore i could see when he was describing a scene or a, a some some like like kind of row or something like that uh make some men the fields and stuff it was like i could see it uh, uh so I could, I could totally engage with that so uh, i'll say of mice and men then john Stanley. amazing book yeah have you used any you read that at school that's sometimes a school book mm -hmm. no they don't really read mm -hmm. uh have you ever checked out kind of blue miles davis no nah, i listened to it you should if you're, you're into jazz stuff it's like a classic the it, album that people take, you know, to to go to if you're looking to get into any sort of jazz at all. It's it's a classic and it's it's really quite. It's not indulgent, you know, like kind of. It's, it's quite easy. It's like based on the blues yep. a lot as well. So like anyone could listen to it, you know, yeah, like kind of. Easy to grasp. Isn't uh, it? Yeah, and, and with jazz, it's, I'll just say quickly, like kind of like there's a lot of pretentious and snobbery it goes on in jazz which is ridiculous and I've always tried to fight that and say jazz started as a folk music you know like kind of to tell stories and it, it, and it lost itself wherever it went you know so um, so don't let those musicians or those people put you off jazz because there's, there's a lot of great stories in jazz in fact that's that's what I'd read jazz musicians by biographies because 
some of the best stories I've ever read have been mm -hmm. about John Coltrane or Miles Davis because the lives that they led, you know, like were, were really interesting as well. So, yeah. And for him, what about your luxury item? Oh, God. Um, a luxury item. Um, <laughs> um, can I take a piano? Aye, yeah, yeah, say that, so. Yeah, that I'd be totally sorted. I, I wouldn't actually need albums or, or books if I just had the piano. You know, like can I? I could just entertain myself on the piano forever. You know, so uh, yeah, I'll take the piano. I'm not going to put this all out to you three, but have you just got any albums or any books or particularly a luxury item that you something you couldn't live without that you would need to take with you if you were stranded on desert island? Probably my guitar. Your guitar? Yeah. Not an amp, though. <laughs> can only take, you can only Acoustic take. all the way. Acoustic, that's true. Mm -hmm. Of yourself, Christy. One thing you couldn't live without. Don't really know. Uh... <laughs> I really <laughs> don't know. Can't think of anything. I'm glad you said guitar. That goes a long way for your guitar lessons, doesn't it? Thanks for that. <laughs> Acoustic guitar? Guitar? Uh, yeah, my, my guitar. Yeah. Your what guitar. yourself? What would you take? Yeah, my guitar. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. We're also boring, aren't we? I know, <laughs> guitar. I can't really think of anything else. No, it would need to be guitar, and that's a tough one as well. For I couldn't even think of five albums. <laughs> it was yeah. pure tough getting you in the spot. I know. Uh, they'd probably all be along the lines. Obviously, you're really into your keyboard music. Mine was was guitar for myself. Right. So uh, definitely, rocks by Aerosmith okay. would be one of those records. Uh, no jacket required by Phil Collins. Oh. It's up there is one of my favourite favourite records of all time. I went to see him at the Albert Hall. Oh, a did you? Years, it was like, I didn't even know he was playing. I went down to see um, the Pesh Modes, right, and then okay. the next night he was playing at the Albert Hall. What? Uh, and a, how many songs he's written as well is unbelievable. Like, all these hits, you know. So, absolutely. Was he good? He was. I mean, he had to sit down actually because yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he was ill, uh, and his son was actually drumming. Sixteen-year-old uh, son. That's how he got the gig, you know. <laughs> if your dad's <laughs> yeah, Phil Collins, yeah. that's how you get gigs, you know. So, uh, but it was a great show, actually. It was uh, because it was a bonus. I wasn't going down to see him necessarily, so uh, yeah, it was great. That is some bonus, really. Isn't that was it? a total bonus, you know. <laughs> so, um, any other questions that you've had? What kind of stuff were you asking earlier on? Dead space. Uh, so, <laughs> it's quite easy, I think. Just from speaking to some of our young people who are obviously, you know, they're playing music and they're trying to get out there, uh, it's quite easy to get a, sometimes disheartened by maybe a gig going badly or, you know, playing to the bar staff. Do you have mm -hmm. any sort of advice to, you know, keeping your morale up and keeping going when you're maybe doing a few gigs? I'm actually just speaking about myself. <laughs> yeah, you may be doing a gig just to the sound guy. Sure. You know, is there any way that you have, have you ever had any gigs like that? Or is there I've, any had, I've had so many gigs like that. Uh, how you do know, you like keep your morale up and keep keep going with it and keep pushing? The, the, there's so many things that you have to go to. Like The biggest thing for me is I've done some really amazing things in music for me. Uh, I've recorded, I took my band to New York and recorded over there, been on the TV with the band, like, um, even being in the studio recording, um, all these kind of things, these are the things you hold on to, you know, like kinda, when you are playing to the pub, uh, the pub uh, manager, you know, the bar manager and the, the cleaner, you know, like who's just like, <laughs> do your song so we can go home. So, and, and that these come after these amazing experiences as well. It's not like, it's not a progression as in you're going to keep going up, going up, it's up and downs constantly. So, when you are playing to two people in a bar or in a, a club or something, then you just remember that you were on the TV or you you did do this. Or, or even if you don't have that to draw on, like, um, it's how passionate you are about this music. It's like another thing that musicians do is they will punish the two people who did come and see you. You know, like, can I, you, you go and you do a gig and, and you've rehearsed and you're stressed, you're, what, what am I wearing, you know, like, what am I eating before the gig, you know, like, just so that you're in the right frame of mind and then you go and there's, like, two or three people in the audience and then you're you're annoyed and you're disappointed. But there's still two people there, you know, like, now, as we're so, talking about, the internet is there. Nobody has to leave the house anymore, but some people do. And if even as one person who's came to see you, then they've chosen not to have everything else. They just come to see what you do. So, like... 
take that as as a huge compliment that they didn't want to watch this fifty million pound movie. They wanted to come in and and hear you play that one song that you've spent the last year trying to write and trying to per perfect. So so things like that, just being in the moment with whatever it is that you that you're doing, you know, and and, and recognizing that you're not playing Wembley yet, and maybe you'll never play Wembley. Maybe I'll never play Wembley. That. You know, sometimes you just need to let go and just say, well, you know what? I'm not at Wembley. I'm, I'm here in a bar or in, in a little venue and there's only four or five or 10 or 20 or 50. You know, like sometimes it doesn't matter how many people's there, you're going to be disappointed that more people aren't there. But just be appreciative that these people have came to see you and that your mum and dad's not telling you to shut up every two minutes that they're, they, they, they want to hear you. It's your mum and dad and that's not cool, but it is cool because they're proud of you and they've, they're have the one that's watching you more than anyone as well, like kind of like, like progress and stuff as well. So don't, don't like if you are playing the song to your mum and dad, then it's great that they're, they're going to give you some feedback. They might be a bit biased, obviously, but it doesn't matter. Like anyone who's there to encourage you, uh, or, or just to come and see you do your thing is is these kind of things can go a long way as well when the chips are down or you, you don't feel like you're, you're up to much. And just also remember that everyone has the same feelings. Mm. Phil Collins, you know, like kind of like oh, everybody, Miles Davis, like you now me, you, you guys, we we all feel that we're, we're not worthy of it, you know, like but but we are because. Everything's learned. Nobody's born playing the piano, the drums, writing. Nobody can write a book, you know. Everything's learned. So all these people put a lot of hard work. We all put hard work into getting to where we are. So if, if you're being honest with yourself and you've put a lot of work into something, then now you should be proud of that as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for, for having me. It's been great. For letting, giving us some insight into... Sorry for battling on. <laughs> no, no. Brilliant. Um, again, please do check out Marco's album, Cowboys and Africans. The link is in the description. And please do like, comment, subscribe, leave a comment. If there's anything else you want to hear or you want to have on the podcast, please let us know. If you're on Spotify and all the like, follow, share before your friends. Thanks very much again. And we'll, very much. We'll, we'll see you again later on. Thank you.